So this year the ESCRS meeting was in Paris. So we started the Arc de Triomphe, which you know Napoleon built to celebrate all his great victories, and et cetera, et cetera. But what's cool is you can go up the stairs um, inside here from down below. This is on top of a giant underground um, area where, because this has a traffic circle around it, so it's a giant underground area where there's subway stops and, and people can go and there's walkways. And so you can actually go up on the stairway up to the top. And so that gives you a really nice view of Paris from the top. And you can see it's all nicely inlaid with all of the carvings. And so you can imagine, you know, a grand army marching through the middle of that. And here again, you can see, you know, they always have these, these always have heroic, you know, people on the side. And there's the other side. Okay, enough said. All right, so eyelids. Question, how oh, right, since, since you're there, let's say questions. Um, what do ogres, onions, and eyelids have in common? Layers. layers. All right, so you've got to remember, many structures in ophthalmology have layers. And you guys really got to, have got to memorize what the layers are. So this is an eyelid seen in cross-section, full thickness eyelid. Let's go ahead and, and let's start talking about the layers. So first layer on the surface. It's going to be the skin. Skin. Right. Second layer. Muscle. All right. Chris. Versus. Conch. Conch. All right. So let's look at these layers as we go closer in. All right. First off, um, I guess we can go to Marshall. What's wrong with this picture? It's upside down. It's upside down. Good. So every once in a while, I just want to make sure you guys are awake. So it's upside down. So usually we want to put the pathology picture is such that the anterior part is facing up instead of down. So now the anterior part is facing down. Now for extra bonus questions, what kind of stain is this? Ah, see so if you guys were paying attention last week. Uh, what was what's up here last week? What's going on? Huh? Trichrome? Trichrome, very good. I just pulled that out of nowhere. That was good. All right, so <laughs> trichrome is, is, a, is an interesting stain because, of course, it stains for, we use it for the corneal dystrophies, and so corneal stromal dystrophies, but it stains epithelial tissue red or pink, if you will, but also muscle tissue. It stains connective tissue blue, and so it's a nice way to say. So, again, here's the surface epithelium, here's the orbicularis oculi muscle, here's the tarsus, the connective tissue, and then lastly, the corneal, the palpebral, I'm sorry, the conjunctiva, the palpebral conjunctiva, and then the cornea underlying it. All right, so when we look at the skin, tell me about the skin on the eyelid. Um, it's keratinized. Okay. And um, stratified squamous because there's layers. Stratified squamous. How is skin on the eyelid different than skin elsewhere on the body? Um, there's no dermis. Uh, exactly. So there's no dermis. And so there's no dermis underneath there, but also there aren't the reedy ridges and pegs. And so if you look at skin elsewhere on the body, there are those reedy ridges and pegs, and then you have the reticular dermis and the dermis with the fat underneath it. And so when you look at eyelid skin, there is no dermis. There's no fat, well, except you know, old guys at the VA, they, they have fat underneath their skin all over the place, but um, there's no fat underneath it, there's no reedy ridges and pegs, so it's a stratified squamous, keratinized epithelium, very similar to skin elsewhere, except it doesn't have the underlying tissue that it has. And in fact, the tissue underneath here is kind of a loose connective tissue, and what that allows is that allows if you have, for example, an allergy or a reaction to something, you can get a tremendous amount of edema in the eyelids. And so there's a lot of edema that can occur there, okay? And then, um, Brad, what, what layer is this now? Um, so is that the, like, the sub-epithelial layer? No, look closer. Um, this is the sub-epithelial layer here. Okay. Oh, is this the uh, subcutaneous fat? No. No? What's the next layer down? Oh, we've got muscle. Muscle. Which muscle? Orbicularis. All right, so this is actually the orbicularis muscle. So 
you want to want to keep straight the difference between what the obicularis does and what the levator does. So remember, the levator comes out um, superficially and then inserts into the tarsus and helps to lift the lid open and close. The obicularis sits underneath the skin but in front of the tarsus, and the obicularis runs this way. And so when you look at the obicularis, the obicularis has three parts to it. Okay, so a chance to save yourself. What are the main parts of the obicularis muscle? So we have the oculi, preceptal, and, sep uh, and tarsus. Uh, kind of, sort of. I orbicularis know, oculi. oculi. Uh, orbicularis oculi. oculi is the whole muscle. Okay, what was that? The orbicularis oculi is the whole okay. muscle. But there's three parts. So there's pre-tarsal, the orbicularis uh -huh. closest to the eyelid margin in front of the tarsus. There is the preceptal, the obicularis that's out a little bit further peripheral in front of the septum, and then there's kind of the orbital part to it. So if you think about it, it's three concentric um, ones, and it almost looks like a C as it, as it comes around when you look at it. And so the obicularis doesn't open and close the eyelid, but it keeps the lid against the surface of the eye, it keeps it from flopping all over, and it runs this way, where the levator runs this way. Okay. All right, what layer are we looking at here? I guess, Rich, we come back to you. Um, so you still get kind of all the layers, but I think you're focusing on the tarsus. There's that big Tarsus, one. okay. So tell me, what is this tissue right here in the tarsus? What kind of tissue is that? I don't know what kind of tissue it is. It's a dense, fibrous connective tissue, very dense. Now, how is the tarsal plate different in primates as opposed to lower animals? There's something that it doesn't have, but I forget. What it it doesn't have cartilage. And so if you ever do surgery on rabbits, you flip their eyelids, it's like, <coughs> the eyelid really tough. And it's got cartilage in it. And rats, same thing, you're doing research with rats, it's got cartilage in them. Primates do not. So we don't have cartilage. It's a dense fibrous connective tissue. But again, when you flip a human eyelid over too, it really gives body to it. I mean, it's pretty dense connective tissue. All right, Mike, what is this stuff right here? Those look like glands. All right, what kind of glands? So they're the meibomian glands. Exactly, they're the meibomian glands. And if you look, the, the way I like to describe these is they're almost like, if you ever look when they grow grapes, how there's, there's clusters of grapes, and then they cluster around a vine. And so there's the grape clusters here with the glands, and then there's the vine in the center. Okay. All right, this is a good segue into a topic that everyone just loves, and you guys are going to know these by heart, glands. All right, now the nice thing about the eyelid is the eyelid has all three major gland types. All right, so Chris, what kind of gland are we looking at here? Type of gland, class of gland. Uh, I think these are eccrine glands. Eccrine glands, all right. And so how do we characterize eccrine glands? Oh, uh, like what, what do they make? Or? Well, that's, that's one of them, but what pattern do we see that tells us these are eccrine glands? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. They have a pattern that's called an asinine pattern. What means is, is not that makes an ass of I when you guys don't get this right, but asinine. And so they form these little round structures. And basically what the glands do is they secrete their contents into this little lumen and then eventually gets gathered up into a duct and secreted. And so the gland stays intact. It secretes its context into the center. And if you look real closely, there'll often be little secretory granules here in the cytoplasm. So in the eyelid, we've actually got a couple different types of, of eccrine glands. What are a couple of eccrine glands that live in the eyelid? Um, so we've got lacrimal glands. Lacrimal glands. So that's a classic example. But what else that you don't usually think about in the eyelids? Yeah, sweat glands. Sweat glands. So believe it or not, your eyelids can sweat. And I know that's, that's hard to believe, but eyelids can actually sweat. Yeah, and so you actually get sweating eyelids. And so these are the eccrine glands asinar type glands in the eyelid. All right, now this is the lid margin, and, and what's good about the lid margin is the lid margin can 
illustrate several different types of glands. And so the first type of gland that I want to talk about here is this gland right in here. And if you look, here is an eyelash follicle. And if you look at the base of the follicles, you'll see these glands right here. And if we look real closely at them, Allie, this is the third, this is the second type of, of gland in general. What type of gland is this? Apocrine gland, okay. And how are these characterized? How do we know they're apocrine glands? Um, they're usually They have snouts, exactly. So if you look at them, they have these apical projections. They look like little snouts sticking out into the lumen. So when they secrete, they secrete their special product and they actually almost cut their little snouts off. And so you see those snouts going into the lumen. Now, why do we stress snouts? Because it helps us to remember the name of the apocrine glands in the eyelid, which are? The glands of, of mole, but we mispronounce it as the glands of mole. Why? Because moles have snouts, and so that's how you remember these. So the glands of mole have these snouts, and they do this apocrine secretion. This is a very interesting secretion. It, it's probably a, a remnant from, you know, far back in, in evolution, because these are scenting glands, and so you have them. And for some reason in the eyelashes, you have them in the axilla, you have them in the groin, and so they're a scenting gland. Um, some animals like deer have very developed, um, you know, epocrine type glands that, that are there. Because if you ever notice deer, you'll see them, they'll, they'll rub their eye inside of their eye on branches and it's a scenting thing. So they actually use it to mark as opposed to, you know, urinating and other things you can scent. And so this is kind of a remnant scenting gland. We really don't know doesn't really do much in humans, but it's still there. And so this is the example of an apocrine gland of mole. All right. All right. What kind of glands are these here, Marshall? Uh, sebaceous. All right. So these are an example of sebaceous glands. And which class are they? What's the third class of glands? Pilosebaceous glands. Main class. I just think sebaceous glands are, I don't know. Holocrine. holocrine glands, all right? So they're holocrine glands. And so the way you remember holocrine glands, they give their whole selves up when they um, go into the lumen. So instead of being like eccrine glands where they stay intact and just squirt some stuff into the lumen, these guys squirt their whole contents in there. And so it's a holocrine gland. Their whole selves just regurgitate in. So for those of you who partake in the two carbon chain disease when you're in college, you know, sometimes you have a little bit too much of that. And boy, sometimes, you know, all of that holocron, all your intestines are all coming up and out. So that's the time when you, you also get religious because you pray that, oh God, get me through this and I won't drink ever again in my life, I promise. So. These are holocrine glands. They regurgitate all of their whole contents into the lumen. And so the example of these are sebaceous glands. And in the eye, specifically, the meibomian glands. But we skipped over another type of sebaceous gland, all right? Dr. Jacobson, what is this gland right here? So it's associated with a hair follicle. Okay. All right. What gland is that called? That's a, like, are you talking about like the overall class or the individual gland? Uh, both. Okay, so it's a holocrine, okay. and it would be a, like a sebaceous gland. And? And? What's it called? Um, I don't know. This is the gland of Zeiss. Oh. And so Zeiss glands are a specialized holocrine gland that are associated with the hair follicle. So they put this greasy holocrine material on there, just like, you know, you often have pilosebaceous glands associated just with your regular hairs elsewhere in the body. And so they put out the, the sebaceous material, but in the eye, you have with the hair follicle on the hair shaft here, you've got a gland of Zeiss. And so there's two different kinds of 
sebaceous glands. You've got the, the sebaceous glands that sit in the eyelid, but you've also got the glands of Zeiss. All right, what kind of stain is this? I guess we're back to Rachel. It's like uh, acrine orange. It's kind of it's the burnt red one, though. So that nope, nope, not quite. So why would I be showing you this? I mean, here's the previous <coughs> slide. There's those glands, and then I'm showing you this. Oil red O. Oil red O, exactly. So it stains lipid. The lipid stain oil red O. And easy to remember it because it stains the oil, these little round O's, you know, so oil red O, it stains them red. What's important to realize before you do an oil red O stain? What do you have to do with the tissue? You can't, you can't fix it normally Exactly, it has to be fresh. Yeah. And so if you want to do an oil stain, you cannot process it because for normal processing, we leach out all of the oils during our dehydration and processing. So if you want to do an oil stain like this on a, you know, on a meibomian gland, you have to have fresh tissue. All right, so everybody set on glands. Okay. All right, let's look at some eyelid lesions here. What are we looking at right here? All right, this is a sterile photograph, right eye. In the middle part of the lower lid, there's a kind of a flesh-colored nodule bump right there. Okay. And then Exactly, totally unrelated, anterior chamber IOL, PI, but they'll just diffuse, look at those little vessels here, just diffuse um, meibomian gland disease, meibomian gland dysfunction. So anything alarming about this lesion? Not necessarily, there's still uh, lashes or yeah. anything. So no lash loss, no notching, no diffuse thickening all around there. So this is maybe one that shows it just a little bit Better. This is a younger person, and you can see these. What do you think these lesions may be? They look uh, kind of like a glazier or uh, sty or yellow. Kind of All thing. right, so let's see what the path showed. There you go. Um, it looks like kind of there on the left, you got like a big giant cell. Exactly, big giant cell here, as opposed to a small giant cell. <laughs> Big giant cell. And what do you think all these little white areas are in here? It's like a lipid. Yeah, so dissolved lipids. So what do you think that lesion was? About like a microgranuloma, but it's so I would call it a calasian. Exactly. So I guess I, I don't know, is it the proper term? Is it calasian as opposed to chalasian? I don't know, I'm not a language scholar. I think it is calasian. So but in any event, what happens is is you get one of the mybomian glands gets plugged up and then you get backup of lipid in spissation, and then it's not infectious, but it causes a lot of inflammation. So you get this lipogranulomatous inflammation, and that's the most you know, common thing that you see in a calasian. And here is a, now this is, is a big giant cell as opposed to a little giant <coughs> cell. So believe it or not, that's all one cell here. So giant cells, again, all these lipid vacuoles here, so there's a lot of backed up lipid and then giant cells. You also can get, you know, lymphocytes and plasma cells with these also. And so that's probably one of the most common things we see in the clinic is, a, you know, is a calasian. Very satisfying. All right, and, and if you drain those, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to drain them, but it's pretty, pretty cool. You flip the lid and you put the clamp on there and you get in the right place and you go in with your blade, it goes, it's like a, you know, giant zit. So a lot of, very satisfying. All right, Chris, what is this? Uh, so we've got an external photo. There's a large flesh-coated lesion um, on the lateral part of the upper lid. Um, there's no materosis, there's no notching, there's really not even a lot of ptosis from it. Um, it looks kind of cystic and nodular. Exactly, so this looks more cystic than it looks solid. What's a little test you can do in two seconds in the clinic to see if it's cystic? Uh, Transilluminated. Exactly, so you take your little fan off head and you put it right next to it and if it is cystic, it'll transilluminate. If it's solid, it, it won't. And so this looks like it's a cystic lesion. And what's the most important layer of a cystic lesion we look at? Uh, the lining. The lining, all right. So this is it at low power. So what can you tell me even at low power here? So 
low power, there's multiple uh, layers of the lining. Um, so it looks stratified, probably, right. probably squamous because there's a lot of, looks like keratin material in the center. Exactly. So you've got this stratified epithelium. There's all this amorphous eosinophilic staining material consistent with keratin. So this would be, this would be an epithelial inclusion epithelial inclusion cyst. And this is the most common um, cyst that we see. And by inclusion cyst, they mean a piece of epithelium got placed underneath the skin for some reason. So it can be trauma, it can be previous surgery, but for some reason, surface epithelium gets underneath and then it grows and grows and grows and makes keratin. So when you remove these, you really want to try to remove them whole because if the keratin spills out, keratin is very inflammatogenic. And so if you break these and the keratin spills out, you get a tremendous amount of inflammation. And so epithelial inclusion cyst is the most common. Here's a close up again, all of this <coughs> keratin, kind of these whirling concentric rings of keratin. All right, and there's the close-up, stratified squamous epithelium. All right, Allie, what are we seeing here? Uh, we got an external photograph. Looks like on the lower lid there's, I would say like a nodule, it's flesh colored. It's hard to, I don't think there's any effacement of the like lashes or, you know, dimpling. Okay. Um, And again, if you look at it, you just get that idea that it's kind of smooth on the surface and there's something inside growing, pushing it out. So likely this is also cystic. And so again, the most important layer we need to look at, the lining, the lining of the cyst. Okay, here's the lining. What are we seeing here? One to two cell layers thick. What does this denote? I think that's consistent with uh, hydrocystoma. <coughs> exactly, and, and it's an eccrine derived hydrocystoma. Okay, so hydrocystoma, what language is that from? Well, the Greek. From the Greek, of course. You know, hydro, <laughs> water, cysts, that's water filled cysts, so from the Greek. So hydrocystoma, so this is a bilayered cuboidal lining. And it looks almost like the ductal lining from an eccrine gland. And so these probably are eccrine duct derived cysts. So eccrine hydrocystoma, the center will be just empty or with, with fluid. So basically just eccrine secretion. So sweat or, or you know, lacrimal secretion. Oh, I thought these were pseudoriferous cysts from that's, the Latin. That's the other name, pseudoriferous cyst, not from the Greek, from the Latin, but that's an old term, old term. So you remember the Romans, the Latins, they took from the Greeks. The Greeks first did it, and then the Romans, they just took it from the Greeks. So. Okay. All right. So what do we have that's different here, Marshall? Um, it looks like the lining of this uh, cyst-like structure has um, out pouchings. Kind yeah, of this lining has snouts in it. So what would this cyst be? Um, deriving from the gland of mole? Well, it's exactly, a... deriving from an epocrine gland. So if you have eccrine hydrocystomas, believe it or not, you can have epocrine hydrocystomas, much less common, but same idea. So it's lined by this bilayered um, cuboidal type lining, but it has snouts on it. And so epocrine hydrocystoma, not eccrine hydrocystoma. <laughs> All right, what do we see in here, um, Abby? Um, external photo of the um, showing the upper lid. There's a lot of small papules that are flesh colored. They look shiny in appearance and they have dimpling in the center. All right, so what do you think looks like this? Um, like molluscum. All right, molluscum, exactly. So I, I've stolen one of the sayings of, of an ocular pathologist who's probably 90 now, but Ray Font was the ocular pathologist at Baylor. And, and his favorite saying when something was classic and nothing else looked like it, and he's from Cuba, by the way, and so he would say, he's your brother in the train station. And so I say, what, what the heck does that mean? You know, you go to the train station, what do you see? You see thousand people, how do you know your brother? Because only your brother looks like, like that, you know? So he's your brother in the train station. 
So what that means is nothing else looks like this. This is classically your brother in the train station. And so when you have multiple clusters of these raised pearly edges, umbilicated centers, this is molluscum contigiosum. <coughs> And similarly, you show brother in a train station, nothing looks like this pathologically. So how would you describe this? So um, heavily keratinized at the top, and there's kind of these clusters that are um, with eosinophilic eruptions. All right, so you see very thickened epithelium. You see it's kind of elevated at the edges, umbilicated in the center. And when you look at these at a higher power, you see what are called molluscum bodies. What the heck are these? Exactly. So the virus takes over the cell, literally, and it pushes the nucleus to the side. And eventually, when you get to the top, all you're left with is just a sack full of virus. And so these molluscum bodies are just eosinophilic staining full of virus. And you see what happens is, is they spill out on the top, which is why these come in clusters because the viruses spill out. And then instead of one, you get eight or 10 of these. Now, the, the nice thing about these is when you want to remove them, you can just shell these things out. They just scoop right out. And so, but there's usually multiple ones. So molluscum contagiosum. All right, Brad, what are we looking at here? This is an external photograph of both the left and right eye and in the um, supranasal quadrant of the upper eyelid we see this um, like kind of nodular lesion. Um, it looks to be uh, no, no surrounding like erythema. Um, there's no ulceration. It looks like it's filled with some sort of substance that's giving it this yellowish hue. Okay, what do you think this could be? Xanthelasma. Exactly, so this is classic xanthelasma. It's got kind of a yellow plaque-like lesion. And what is it characterized by pathologically? Um, so it's lipid filled. Lipid filled what? What uh, kind of cells have lipid? Like macrophages. Macrophages, exactly. So if you want to sound intelligent, you say macrophages. Macrophages. So you say it with a British accent. So people think you're smart if you speak with a British accent. <laughs> macrophages. And so if you look at these, these are all foamy, <clears throat> lipid laden macrophages in the subepithelial tissue. Now, when I was a resident in the olden days, they taught us that this meant you have hypercholesterol and that you had to do blood tests and people <laughs> had a chance that they had hypercholesterol. Is that necessarily true? No. No. So it can be associated with high cholesterol, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. So something focally is going on and you get this deposition of this cholesterol material in these foamy uh, macrophages underneath the skin. And so not necessarily associated with high cholesterol. And here's a high power view. Look at these, they call them foamy. And so you see these macrophages, they've got the nucleus in the center and this foamy, you know, ground glassy lipid material in the cytoplasm. So that's classic xanthelasma. You know, I don't mean to not call on you. If you would like to try one, you can. That's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it was really not a positive. Answer. Yeah, bring it on, man. You know, it was kind of a okay. I'll do it. Well, just describe what you can, what you see, though. Tell me what you're seeing here. So it looks like an external photo of the right eye and lower eyelid, kind of a raised lesion um, that extends up to the lash line. Um, kind of. It goes about. Flesh colored and out. Remember we showed you the, all the cysts and they were really smooth and like something was inside pushing out. If you look at this, it's almost corrugated here on the surface. What do you think that could be? We'll do the path. Here's the path. What the heck does that look like? And that's fine. I mean, that's that's a good an answer. I don't know. It's okay. I knew the last one was okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Oh, I knew, I, oh. Well, it's interesting. We always know the answer when when we're not being called on. So it goes, oh, 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 oh. And then as soon as the spotlight hits you, it's like the Iron Curtain. 
the sense across your cerebral cortex, chunk, and you're like, what's your name? <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, so. Rachel, what is this? Exactly. So it's a papilloma. It's got that little corrugated, almost like a little um, uh, cauliflower appearance to it. So this is a squamous papilloma. And if you look at this at low power, you've got these fingers of thick and acanthotic epithelium sticking out. And then they've got a little fibrovascular cord in the center. What's all this stuff? Keratin. So there's hyperkeratosis. There's a lot of keratin on here. So. How do we remember a squamous papilloma pathologically? It's a gloved hand. So you've got a hand with a thick glove on it. So you've got these central fibrovascular cores and you've got this thickened epithelium surrounding it and it's sticking out. And so you can see again here, these fingers are sticking out and there are these little fibrovascular cores in the center, it's hyperkeratotic. And so this is a classic squamous papilloma. It can be viral. It can also just be um, just reaction to whatever. Sometimes there's no viruses in it. Here's the close-up. Central area of the fibrovascular core, thickened acanthotic epithelium, hyperkeratosis, increased keratin cell layer, all on the surface, tons of keratin. So squamous can papilloma. See, can you see pathologically uh, if it is viral, virus associated? You can't tell pathologically. But if they do studies, sometimes they'll find virus. Most of the time, they don't. And when you said like the molluscum, you can scoop out, do you mean like? Molluscum, you can literally uh, numb it up and use the side of a needle and just go, and they'll just like core out. Uh, okay, you leave a little like, divot. Well, yeah, it'll leave a little divot when you do, but it'll core out with these, you actually have to, you know, remove them at the base. But sometimes they can be pedunculated, and so you can actually just cut them off right at the stock, and, and they'll come off nicely. And this just shows you a little bit of a closer view. Here's, they even will get little keratin filled cysts in them and little crypts with keratin in them. And here we see a cross section. So this is where someone, you took your gloved hand and you just cut the fingers off right across. So here's the fibrovascular core in the center. There's the epithelium surrounding it. All right, what do we see, Mike, here? So this is a close-up of a kind of waxy, darker colored lesion. There's kind of multiple parts to it. Uh, it just looks a little stuck on. Yeah, what do you think all this crusty stuff is here? Probably keratin. Probably keratin. So these are hyperkeratotic. So oftentimes, you'll see these guys in clinic. You'll say, how long has this lesion been there? I say, well, was there a few months ago and then it fell off, but then it grew back. And so what, what they're talking about is just the keratin comes off. And you see these guys, people pick at them too. And so they'll often pick the keratin off, but the underlying lesion will stay on there. All right, so how is this? It looks almost like the papilloma, but what's different about this one? They turn the bone inside out. Exactly, so instead of the fingers going out, it's almost like they turn over and go in like a a hairy spider. And so instead of the fingers going out, they go in. So it's like a tarantula with multiple legs and hair around them. And so here's the fibrovascular cores, but the fingers of acanthotic epithelium are extending in instead of out. So that's the difference. So this is a seborrheic keratosis. And so that it also has hyperkeratin. It can have keratin-filled crypts. It can even have keratin-filled cysts that you can see right there. Now, the other thing that these have is they'll often have a brown coloration to them. So they'll often have some benign melanocytes along the basilar layer. And so when you look at these, these aren't you know, active, they'll just benign melanocytes along the basilar layer. And so it's not uncommon that you'll have this diffuse ribbon of brown along the basilar layer. So when you look at these, they'll look tan or they'll look brown. So this is a classic seborrheic keratosis. All right, what are we seeing here, Chris? So today we're seeing the lesion, <coughs> this is an external photo, um, but we're seeing the lesion just below the lower lash line. Um, again, it's kind of rough on the surface, maybe a little bit flesh colored to yellow on the surface. Um, there's no matterosis and there's no, you know, uh, nodulosis or any, any so massive kind of, kind of almost severe keratosis looking. 
you know, hard to tell. So we look at the path. Now, the difference in this one is, again, it's hyperkeratotic. It's got the thick end acanthotic epithelium. It's got a tremendous amount of what we call basophilic degeneration of collagen. So these are usually in areas where there's a lot of sun exposure, basophilic degeneration. But if you look at the epithelium itself, the epithelium is more active. And so here's, again, um, keratin world down below, keratin in the cells. Right. Boy, my, my fellows are never here, so I can insult them. But obviously, a, a fellow took this picture. Why? Because it's out of focus, you know. So, so see, attending pictures are always in perfect focus. So, that must be the fellow that took this. And so that's the other thing. Whenever I show videos, if it shows beautifully done, I say, okay, now this is me doing this. If it shows a complication, I say, well, obviously, this was the fellow, <laughs> you know, doing it. So we get to say that. So, this is what we call actinic keratosis. And actinic keratosis is kind of a seborrheic keratosis gone one step further. So it hasn't quite become a malignancy, a squamous cell, but it's starting to show funny features. And so you'll have nucleoli in here, you'll have more activity of the cells, and you still get hyperkeratosis, keratin pearls, keratin world. So this is called actinic keratosis. <coughs> Now, what do we see in here, uh, Al? In the external photograph um, on the lower lash line, looks like there's a lesion that's ulcerated, which is really obvious, but then there's like a raised, which looks like raised border, kind of pearly, um, and it looks like it's a facing, like the, the lashes and kind of the border of the lip, which okay. is concerning. All right, so this is worrisome. Because you've lost lashes, you've got... Now, where do you think that lesion ends? Here? No. Here? Probably. Yeah, so if you look at it, boy, that thing maybe takes up 70% of the entire lower lid. So when you see a lesion that's, uh, uh, you know, ulcerated in the center, it's a little bit raised on the outside, you've lost lashes, there's maybe thickness next to it, what's your concern? Um, <clears throat> basal cell. Basal cell, and so this is a, a pretty classic, not quite your brother in the train station, but maybe your second cousin in the train station. You think that's him, but not quite sure. <laughs> so um, so that this is really a, a suspicious appearance. And so this is another way these can present, because remember, they're always not all classic. And so this, if you look at it, looks almost kind of a solid, maybe even a cystic lesion, but again, look, Loss of lashes, look at the notch. So same thing here, same idea here. When we look at the path, does this confirm it? Okay, so we've got these nodules of the tumor cells, they have this dark basophilic staining nucleus, a scanty cytoplasm, but again, the classic finding here is that the nuclei line up around the edges of the lesion, they call it palisading. So this is classic for a basal cell. Now basal cell, the most common type of basal cell is called a nodular or nodular cystic. <coughs> this would be a nodular basal cell. We look at a close-up, once again, large nuclei, lining up around the periphery of each of these lesions. Now, the other thing that you see is, you see this little white space here? We call that a meaningful artifact. And by that, I mean it's an artifact. It's, it's tissue shrinkage during processing, but it occurs in basal cells. And so for some reason, these basal cells are more tightly packed in there. And as you process the tissue, they shrink a little bit more, whereas other tumor cells don't. And so you'll often see a little white halo around each of these nodules of the tumor cells. So we call it a meaningful artifact because it really only does that in basal cells. All right, so here again, we see a nodular cystic basal cell, most common variety of basal cells. All right, now, Marshall, there is one type of basal cell that's a little bit different that we worry about more than run-of-the-mill basal cells. What is this? Uh, morpheiform. Morpheiform. What does that mean? I mean, why is that different? Um, it's, it's usually flatter. It sends out um, 
like finger like projections um, underneath the skin, so you're worried about like a more extension of the tumor. Okay, so if you look at it, it's characterized by these little fingers of tumor cells, and then in between you have this dense connective tissue. They call this desmoplastic reaction. The problem with these is they're not a localized nodule. They can send little fingers out underneath the tissue, so it's very hard to know what your margins are. And so if you are concerned about a morpheiform type of basal cell, instead of just removing a chunk, you may often refer them off for what's called Mohs surgery. Now remember, Mohs, it's the guy's name, M-O-H-S. It's not, you know, Mo, you know, M-O-E, you know, Mo, you know, Mo. You guys don't even know the Stooges? My God, I know. There's, they weren't even around when I was little. That's how old they are. But the Stooges, Mo, you know. So, that's but, early. It's not Mo, yeah, that's Curly, but, but, but my favorite with Curly is Mo. That's a good one, but, but, but Mo would, and, and boy, you hate this now because you can't show this to kids anymore, so Mo would poke Curly in the eye with his fingers, and he'd go, and so, so Curly would go, yeah, and then Mo would go, so, so not that Mo, but Mo's the surgeon, M-O-H-S, and so there's a way you can remove the tissue with taking little fresh, pieces of tissue, you freeze them, you look at them under the microscope, so that's the most technique. So you do that in a, in a morphia form. Yeah. Now, there is even another way that these basal cells can present. What does this look like? So, more superiorly, you kind of see the classic palisading and the basophilic appearance of basal cell. But more inferiorly, there's um, more of a pinkish coloration and where you're pointing over there was kind of like a a keratin pearlish type thing. Exactly. So what is this? A combination of the two. Yeah, it's actually, they call it a basal squame. And so you can even get, you know, basal cell carcinomas come from the little pluripotential cells in the basal layer of the epithelium. And so they actually even call these basal squames. And so they can even start to show some squamous characteristics. And so the reason why this is important is these, again, are more aggressive than a run-of-the-mill basal cell. So regular basal cells, you know, you remove them, they, you know, you take care of them, that's it, they go away. But morpheiform or basal squames, you worry about them because they can be just a little bit more aggressive than a run of the mill. And I always show this picture. This was one of Rick Anderson's original patients. This is a tough old ranch lady from Nevada. She had a morpheiform. And they said, you know, come back in because this thing can spread, we better take care of it. And so she said, I'm an old lady, leave me alone. And so she went back to the ranch, and this is 10 years later. And the reason that she came in, her family brought her in because of this smell. And so you can see a basal cell left on its own for 10 years. If you look back here, it's growing into the sinuses. There's even CSF dripping out here. So you say basal cell is a benign tumor, but if you let it grow for 10 years, it can do this. So believe it or not, this was a basal cell let to grow for 10 years. Now. What do you do? I mean, you can't do a hemifacectomy, and so this is a really difficult problem at this point. So take care of the basal cells when you can. All right. Brad, what is this? Yeah, so this is an external photograph of the, gosh, maybe left eye. Um, and on the lateral lid margin, you see this large um, nodular uh, lesion that is causing some matterosis um, at the lid margin. Um, it's got like, it looks like some hyperkeratosis um, and maybe some small central ulceration as well. What would you be concerned about with this one? A squamous cell. Yeah, because this has like a lot of keratin on it, but it's got almost kind of an orangish appearance to it. And so indeed, um, there's another way that these can present like this. And so it's interesting, they call it a rodent ulcer, and I don't know what rodent means. It, may, it must mean something, but I think of it as rodent. It means like a rodent's been chewing on it. So rodent ulcer, or the way I remember that is a rodent's chewing on it. So you'll often see these will present. Look at this patient. This is sun-exposed skin, probably a farmer, rancher. Again, a lot of sun damage, and sure enough, here it is right here. So when we think of tumors of the eyelid, um, basal cell is by far the most common, at least 90%. So if you take all lid tumors, basal cells, 90%. Squamous cells, maybe 5 or 6%. And so basal cells are totally sun exposure related. And so they occur on the lower lid, medial canthus. 
They occur less frequently on the upper lid laterally. Why? Because your brow shades that. And so some of us, well, let's see who's more co I guess you're our co in here, you know, a little bit bigger brow here, so it shades a little bit better. And so we get that. But um, squamous cells, on the other hand, can occur both upper and lower lids. And so they're still thought to be sun-induced, but not quite as much. You can get the, the nodular type again, or you can get this rodent <laughs> ulcer. And what is the squamous cell characterized by? Hyperkeratosis. Okay. And like mostly like pink rather than like the basal cell, which is kind of like the purple-ish. Or the blue, yeah. So this is more pink than blue. You look at the cells here, they tend to be pink. We look at them closely, and not only do we have these pink cells, here's the nucleoli again, they're active cells, but what are these guys? Keratin whorls. Keratin whorls. So you get keratin whorls in these squamous cell carcinomas. So you get these keratin whorls in there, you have the big atypical pink cells as opposed to the blue cells. So this is a classic squamous cell. All right, I guess we're coming back to... Do you want to try it? Sure. What are you seeing here? Sorry? Do you want to give, give it a shot? What are you seeing here? The extra right eye. shiny appearance of the upper and lower eyelids with uh, I don't know if that's bleeding or the coloration of the looks like bleeding. What would your concern here be? Um, <coughs> trauma. Actually that well the problem is this is what we call the great mimicker and so these, you often do not see these initially. You'll see them second or third hand. So first thing, person goes into the dock in the box. You know, they go to the, you know, whatever they call it, the walk-in emergency center, you know, dock in the box. So what do they do? They give them um, Neosporin. They say, yeah, that's <coughs> conjunctivitis. Give him Neosporin. It doesn't get better after two weeks. They go to another family doc. What does he give him? He gives him genomycin. You know, it doesn't get better after two weeks. Finally, they see you, but if you look right here, that lid margin is really thick. And there are these little yellow areas here, and look at the lashes are gone. Same thing here, thick, lashes gone, chronic blepharoconjunctivitis. What's your fear here? Sebaceous carcinoma. Exactly, so this is a sebaceous or meibomian gland carcinoma. So they call it the great mimicker. It can look like a blepharoconjunctivitis, it can look like a recurrent chalazion, and so you really have to have a high index of suspicion. But if you look, this is not just blood conjunctivitis because the lid margin is thick and you're losing lashes here and you've got all this lipid in here. So this is a classic um, diffuse sebaceous gland carcinoma. But again, they, they can present a little bit differently. Look at this one. This was called a chronic chalazia. But if you look again, look at that lid margin. It's thick from here all the way to here. And so this turned out to be a um, sebaceous gland carcinoma of the lid. So when you look at sebaceous gland carcinomas, the one thing nice about lids is, is lids, the pathology kind of looks like how they behave. So you look at the basal cell, those nuclei look kind of benign. You know, they're uniform, they're not a lot of nuclei, they're big, but they're benign. You look at these nuclei, boy, clumped chromatin all over the place, nucleoli all over the place. You look at that, even if you don't know pathology, you say, wow, that looks really nasty looking. And indeed, that's how these behave. Fortunately, these are only about 1% of, of all lid tumors, but you gotta recognize these because these can not only invade locally, these can distantly metastasize. People can die from these. So you really wanna recognize these. And if you look right here on this close up, look at that clumped chromatin, look at the nucleoli. What the heck are these things here, and here, and there, and there? Those are mitotic figures. So there's mitotic figures. So we have one of the neuropath people's rotating with us in path, and I love the pathologist. I didn't know this term. He calls them, he calls them mites. And so real pathologists, I'm not a real pathologist. I'm just a humble ophthalmologist, but the real pathologists call them mites. 
So there's mitotic figures all over the place here. So these are very, very aggressive tumors. And here again, look at that beautiful mitotic figure there. Look at these. Some are big, some are little. What do we call when some cells are big and some are little? From the Greek. But polymorphism or pleomorphism, either one. So different size, different shape. Exactly. So polymorphism, pleomorphism. So lots of that. Big nucleoli, a big, I'm sorry, mitotic figure, big mite right there. So very, very aggressive tumors. You don't want to miss those. What kind of stain is this? Red O. Well, red O. Okay. Just again to show you that we don't really do this anymore because we can do specialized immunoperoxidase stains. But again, oh, well, red O. All right. That didn't count them. Right, That's what right. is this? What are we seeing uh, here? So this is an external photograph. Lower lid has a pigmented lesion. Um, looks like there's still, you know, lashes there. The lid margin looks relatively intact. So I would guess benign. All right, so probably benign. And you take it off. What is this? So you got some nests of cells. Uh, I would guess that this would be a nevus. More specific? Um, looks like it's at the junction, also in the dermis, so compound. Exactly, so when you rate nevi, if they have a component of the melanocytes at the junction, we call that a junctional nevus. But if you have nevi, nevi at the junction and in the subepithelial or dermal tissue, we call that a compound nevus. What is this? So this one looks like it would be of a dermal. Exactly. So if you look here, the melanocytes are not at the junction. There's a clear space. They're underneath it. And so we call it a dermal nevus. Now, remember, there is no dermis in the lid. And so it's kind of a misnomer. It should be called a subepithelial nevus. But because dermis has been around for, you know, 100 years, we've been describing it, we call it a dermal nevus. So no junctional component. Dermal nevus, completely benign. All right. What do we see in here, Chris? External photo, there's a much more extensive pigmented lesion in the lower lid. Um, we see definite matterosis there. Mm -hmm. I'd be concerned about malignancy. Yeah, so you'd be more concerned about this one. And if you look right here, first of all, these these look kind of benign. You're looking at it, you're saying, wow, that's pretty benign looking. But then you look closer, and what do we see here? Look at those nucleoli. Look at the cells there. So indeed, this is now a malignant melanoma. And now these, again, you want to recognize, these can metastasize. They can invade locally, they can metastasize. So these can be bad actors. Unfortunately, the incidence of malignant melanoma of the lids is going up. Why? Because the, the baby boomers were, among all of our other bad traits, sun worshipers. And so you had that golden tan and made you look beautiful and glow. And so now, as the baby boomers are getting older, we're seeing tumors such as melanomas now increasing so they shouldn't be so i guess I'm, I'm behind the times i finally was reading about how the derisive term that the millennials now use where you say okay boomer <laughs> and you guys do that so if i start yammering on you guys are allowed to say okay boomer and roll your eyes when we say that but this is one thing that is really bad about the boomers is all the old sun exposure that we used to have and so we are seeing more and more malignant melanomas of the lid and so you guys are going to see more of these when you're you know, out seeing patients out in practice. All right, what the heck is this, Allie? Uh, this is an external photograph. The upper lid looks, I don't know if I want to say it's swollen because the rest of the skin around it doesn't look too terribly infected. Yeah, your first thought is, wow, maybe someone's got a preceptal cellulitis, they've got a big swelling here, but it's not really hot, it's not really infected and so you go ahead and you do a biopsy and this is what it shows. What kind of cells are these? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. And if you look at them, they're medium-sized, uniform, lots of them, but again, subtle nucleoli in here. So what is this? Uh, lymphoma. It's a lymphoma. So now, lymphomas of the orbit are much more common, but remember you can get lymphomas of the lid. Less common, but Keep that in mind that when you're talking about lid tumors, they're very rare, but you can still get lid lymphomas. Usually the lid lymphoma is an extension of orbital <laughs> lymphoma, but you can still get lid lymphomas. 
Yeah. All right, boy, Marshall, what are we seeing here? Um, it's an external photograph showing both eyes. So the, for the left eye, the eyelid looks uh, like 30% uh, eroded, especially nasally, and there's a round uh, red circular lesion right in the center. Yeah, people call this violaceous. It looks kind of a deep red, red blue, kind of a violaceous looking lesion. All right, so now I just wanted to show you guys a couple of obscure ones, just so you know not all things are common. Hopefully something like this will never show up on the boards, but every once in a while they'll toss one in. So old person, <coughs> big violaceous lesion here. And if you look right here, big cells, but lots of mites in here. Lots of mites, big cells, lots of mites. Believe it or not, this is called a Merkel cell tumor. And so you can get these, they, they're thought to be, you know, arising from, from parts of nerve nerves sometimes, nerve endings. <clears throat> but you can get the old people, violaceous lesion, lots of mitotic figures in here. This is called a Merkel cell carcinoma. You can even get adenocarcinoma of the lid. Very uncommon, but this is an adenocarcinoma. And the way you remember these is you've got these islands of these little glandular cells swimming in a sea of mucin. So this is a mucinous adenocarcinoma. And again, it gives me a chance to show special stains. We actually have a mucin stain. It's called mucicarmine. Very rarely used, so I didn't make you guys memorize that. But again, islands of adenocarcinoma cells swimming in a sea of mucin. So these are just weird tumors. So Merkel cell tumors, adenocarcinomas, mucinous adenocarcinomas, very weird tumors, hopefully you'll never see. But you've got to know basal cell, squamous cell, sebaceous, and melanoma. So if you know those and know those down, you'll be okay, you know, for not only boards, but more importantly for practice. All right, I think that's it. Okay, so again, this is looking from the Arc de Triomphe out, outside of downtown. This is called La Défense, and it's got this big, you know, concrete thing around it. So this is where they've got a lot of, of tech businesses live out here. Where, where is that? Paris. Wow. Yeah, so this is out. So you know that the center is really historic. <laughs> Outline, you still you like still that. have to make, I mean, history is great, but you know, you still, people still have to have jobs and do things. Wait, in the that's city. crazy. So yeah, that's that's uh, Paris. I was yeah, there for like 10 days. days. But if you look out here, <laughs> I just look this is, building. I did it. <laughs> well, believe it or not, this is the extension of the Champs Elysees right here. All the way out, so it goes around the circle of the Arc de Triomphe and you go out. And yeah, so La Defense, this is called. So, like the downtown, 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 downtown is <laughs> this way, the other way. I just far. like literally like, like all the historic. Oh, I'm standing on the top of the Arc de Triomphe like, right here. Yeah, no, I'm meaning you could see downtown the other way. Yeah, okay. exactly. It's that's, not like that far. That's next, next week. week. Okay. Next week. Hold on, hold that thought. All right. All, right. all right, so next Tuesday is. Conj. Conj. All right, so everybody read your comment.